Okay, so welcome to today's workshop, Strategies for Performance-Based Online Assessment. Um, I've started the recording, and in today's workshop, we'll be discussing ways that you can implement and assess student achievement of higher-order thinking tasks, such as demonstrating an activity, creating a product, or completing a process. These types of assessments are authentic, open-ended, real-world I will be your presenter today. My name is Amanda Smothers, and I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. Um, I've been in my current position for about a year and a half. I've been teaching college English for over 12 years. This will be my 13th year. And I graduated from NIU with my PhD in English in 2016. And if you have any questions, as I mentioned during today's presentation, you can feel free to post them to the chat. Um, or if you want to, you know, stop me, just raise your hand. Use that little raise hand button there um, in the bottom middle of your screen. And then I'll call on you and you can share out with your audio. So in the text chat, I just want you to tell us what's your department or your division, um, what's your role, are you an instructor, are you a professor, are you a TA, and then what do you hope to get out of this workshop? So I'll give you just a, a minute or two to type all of that in there, um, and then I will read them out um, so that they're there for the recording. Okay, so Chris is an assistant professor in the School of Nursing and wants more assessment tools for online teaching. And Cheryl, you're a TA looking for some options for assessment. You're from ETRA and new to NIU. Welcome. Um, Tyler, where are you from? Maybe we've lost Tyler there. Um, okay, so we'll move on then. Um, nice to meet you both. And uh, hopefully you'll get plenty out of today's workshop um, to help you with your goals. Um, so our workshop objectives today are to identify some of the benefits of performance-based assessment over traditional assessment, um, particularly how to develop appropriate performance-based assessments for your courses. And we'll kind of talk about um, you know, the whole process of, of developing that assessment that fits into the process of uh, planning your course and your learning activities um, and, and how that, um, how performance-based assessment is, you know, meaningful, real-world assessment. Um, and then also how to cultivate some assessment tools to aid you in grading performance-based assessment. So those are the things that we're hoping to accomplish in today's workshop. And I'll ask you all for some ideas as well as we go through. So first of all, before we can talk about how to create a performance-based assessment, we probably want to define what performance-based assessment is. Um, so performance-based assessment could take many forms, and it depends on the discipline. Generally speaking, though, performance-based assessment measures students' ability to apply the skills and knowledge that they've learned from the course by using higher-order thinking skills to create something or complete a process. The most genuine performance-based assessments tend to be those that require students to perform a task that mirrors what, for example, a professional may be asked to do in that discipline. 
These, and that'll also depend on the course too, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, these assessments, performance-based assessments, may also ask students to apply what they've learned to a real-world situation, whether that's in a professional context for the discipline or in a more broad context that applies to their own lives or, you know, just citizens' lives in general. So I just want to kind of um, find out where you're at. How do you or do you approach performance-based assessment in a face-to-face -face course? So have you done performance-based assessment in your face-to-face -face courses? Um, and then we'll kind of touch on, on the next slide, what's different about an online course. Um, so how do you approach or how could you approach performance-based assessment in a face-to-face -face course where you're all in the classroom at the same time? And again, you can post, you know, your feedback to the chat if that's how you feel more comfortable, or you can raise your hand, and I can call on you, and you can share your audio with your microphone. Okay, so Chris used, used group work and discussions and case studies. Case studies are definitely a good performance-based assessment, um, especially if they're, they're well-designed. Any other ideas um, of how you've done them in a face-to-face -face course? All right, Socratic questioning. Maybe also for, um, for like a business class or even for, you know, a speech class or an English class or really any class, depending on how you present it, you could do maybe um, presentations in class or speeches, um, and those might model real-world um, uh, activities. Um, so maybe you you have a history class who uh, a history class, and you you want them to do presentations, and maybe you have them be sort of like conference presentations. So it's kind of a more of a real-world application of something that they might do if they go into the field. Um, and then Cheryl agrees with Chris, usually open-ended questioning presentations. Great. Um, I'll give just a few more seconds in case anybody has any other thoughts, and then we'll kind of pop into talking about online stuff. Okay, so let's kind of um, shift gears a little bit and talk about how online assessment might be different. What are the challenges for performance-based assessment in an online course? And these can be things that you've encountered or things that you can imagine uh, you would encounter if you were to do performance-based assessment in an online course if you haven't gone that track. Um, in moving online or if you're not teaching fully online. So how, how would online be different or what, what might be the challenges of moving a performance-based assessment online? And I'll give you a couple minutes just to, to think about that and then share either in the chat or share with your microphone.
All right, that's where Chris is having a problem. Um, and Cheryl says that in terms of performance-based assessment, um, usually she's able to scaffold tasks and model it more easily, which is more difficult in an asynchronous online course. Um, and you know, that's that's definitely true. So an asynchronous online course, that might be difficult or it might take more work on your part because you might need to, you know, have somebody record you doing these things um, so that you can scaffold them and kind of post them online. But then how do you know if students can, uh, you know, how are you going to measure whether students are, you know, able to follow along and, you know, you don't get those same cues that you do. Uh, in a face-to-face -face course where maybe you model something and then have students do it and then you can kind of go around and tell them, you know, oh, you need to do it this way or, you know, you're doing it incorrectly in this way. Here's how it should actually be done um, and do a little bit more of that one-on-one -on -one while you're scaffolding the tasks, definitely. So that it is more difficult in an asynchronous online class even in a synchronous online course, um, you know, because if you're in a collaborate session, you're not, you don't have all of your students right in front of you necessarily. You might be able to see the grid with them, but you can't pay attention to everything all at once. Um, so that might be a little bit more difficult. Any other thoughts on uh, the challenges of online performance-based assessment? Yeah, definitely. The cues are, it, it, that's that's difficult for sure. And, you know, you can kind of some somewhat get around that or, or compensate for that. Um, you, it might take more work, though, because you might need more formative assessment, uh, more things, more steps for students to, to go through and to submit, you know, maybe pieces of the major assessment um, ahead of time, you know, and, and break that up into more manageable pieces um, and really do that 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 work of scaffolding and then giving them a lot of feedback and but it does take it might take more time and more effort to to get that done in an online course All right, so um, then now that we know, you know, what performance-based assessment is a little bit, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but what it kind of is um, and, you know, what that might look like in a face-to-face -face course and what the challenges might be in moving that online, um, then why per the question becomes why performance-based assessment? Why would we choose performance-based assessment over, you know, a traditional assessment like an exam um, or just, you know, a, a research report or something like that. Why would we want to do performance-based assessment? And sometimes a research report could be considered performance-based assessment. It just depends on how it's set up. Um, so performance-based assessment addresses the importance of application of course concepts to evaluate student learning. So they're not just showing you what they know, they're able to actually apply what they know and you're able to evaluate whether they're doing that correctly. So in other words, these types of assessments allow students to demonstrate how well they can apply content knowledge to critical thinking, problem solving, and analytical tasks. And the performance-based assessment also addresses what faculty value in student learning which is critical and analytic thinking, drawing inferences, reaching conclusions, problem solving, all those higher order thinking, um, critical thinking skills. And in performance-based assessments, students use those higher level thinking skills to create or to perform something that has real world application. So I thought that this quote from Herman, it's a little bit old, but I think it really applies still. Um, but I thought this was pretty uh, apropos to this discussion of performance-based assessment and why performance-based assessment particularly. And Herman says, mere acquisition of knowledge and skills does not make people into competent thinkers or problem solvers. To know something is not just to passively receive information, but to interpret it and incorporate it. 
Meaningful learning is reflective, constructive, and self-regulated. So again, I just thought this was very important um, that really kind of encapsulated why you would implement um, a performance-based assessment. Yes, a constructivist approach, Cheryl, definitely. Um, so again, not just knowing, not just students not just showing us that they know facts and figures and, and know the course content, but that they can actually move beyond knowing to doing. So next, I just want to kind of highlight some of the differences between um, authentic assessment or, you know, and what we're considering as authentic assessment in this particular context, which is performance-based assessment, um, and then traditional assessment or assessment as, as we think of assessment traditionally of, of you know, exams maybe. Um, so traditional assessment focuses mainly on students being able to memorize and recall facts. So for example, on an exam. So it, in other words, it measures content recall. In the traditional assessment view, the primary mission is to develop maybe productive citizens who possess a certain body of knowledge. And then the exam is used to measure whether students have acquired that knowledge. Um, so it's the acquisition of the curriculum and this body of knowledge, this idea of the body of knowledge. So in other words, the curriculum is driving the assessment. The knowledge is the curriculum the instructor delivers, and the assessments are developed from that body of knowledge. So compare that to authentic assessment. Um, so an authentic assessment focuses on the practical application of concepts in real world, world circumstances. So in the authentic assessment view, the primary mission is also to develop productive citizens, but in this view, those citizens should be able to perform meaningful real-world tasks to demonstrate their skills. So the assessment then would measure whether students are able to perform those tasks, and the curriculum is established around helping students arrive at the point where they can perform those tasks. So in other words, the assessment is steering the curriculum. Um, so uh, the authentic view measures content application over the traditional view, which measures content recall. And then with the authentic view, you're, it's a demonstration of the curriculum versus the traditional view's acquisition of the curriculum. And then with the authentic assessment, where it's a performance of meaningful tasks rather than just uh, exhibiting that you have a body of knowledge in the traditional view. Um, so in, in some, Traditional assessment teaches students to know a subject, whereas authentic assessment teaches students how to do the subject, so or how to do history, how to do math, how to do sociology. You don't necessarily have to choose one method over the other. You don't have to say, I'm going to throw out traditional assessment and go gung-ho for authentic assessment. Sometimes a combination of both methods is going to work best for your objectives. It just depends on the discipline. It depends on the course. It depends on the learning objectives of that individual course, um, you know, whether there's any, you know, mandated objectives of that course. Um, so sometimes students might need to memorize content. They might need to have a body of knowledge before they can learn to apply that content. So for example, in nursing, students might need to memorize medical terminology before they start to work toward practicing on patients. Uh, so in other words, they would have a good content knowledge base about medicine before they apply that knowledge in a real context as demonstrated through uh, authentic assessment opportunities or, or a performance-based assessment. So these two can work together. It's just being very intentional about when you use traditional assessment, um, whether that's absolutely necessary that they, you know, memorize these facts versus when they, they're using authentic assessment and able to apply what they've learned to a performance-based assessment. So some of the essential components of performance-based assessment, and you know, um, you may be able to infer these, um, that they're complex, 
um, that they are authentic, that they're either process or product oriented, and open ended. Um, so, you know, if it's a, a process um, oriented, it may be less open ended than if it's product oriented. So, what I mean by that is, um, so if they have to go through a process, um, so for example, if you're in a lab, a science lab and they need to do a specific process and they need to demonstrate that through a performance-based assessment. Um, there's not a whole lot of open-endedness to that. Uh, whereas, you know, if it's something more creative, if they're in music and they need to compose a piece of music, that's a little bit more open-ended. That would be product-oriented. So, you know, it just depends on what uh, the goals are of, of that assessment. All right, so we have a Bloom's taxonomy here, and I'm sure at least some uh, some of you have, have heard of Bloom's taxonomy at some point. Um, but one of the first steps that you want to take when you're designing any assessment is to identify the goals of the assessment. So what do you want students to be able to demonstrate to you? In looking at Bloom's taxonomy, we want to look beyond the understand and remember the lowest levels. Um, that's where we get in that traditional assessment um, of, you know, they memorize these facts, they memorize the content, and then they regurgitate that information on their exam, the midterm exam, or the unit exam, or whatever it may be. Um, so that's where, you know, remembering is recalling facts and basic concepts. Maybe they move a little bit beyond that uh, on the exam, and they have a um, short answer where they have to explain an idea or a concept or classify something. Um, so, but we want to move a little bit beyond that for performance-based assessment. Um, and we want to work towards the higher levels uh, of Bloom's taxonomy that lend themselves to students actually doing something. So applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating something, those levels will help you identify the goals of your performance-based assessment before you decide what the assessment will be. So we want to have some, some goals. So students will be able to um, design um, you know, the, a set for uh, their their set design course if they're in, you know, the theater program. Um, or they might uh, do, uh, they might want to author. So they might author uh, a sh creative short story or piece of creative nonfiction for their writing course. Um, so what what are some of the goals? What are the goals? What, what do you want students to be able to, to do? What do you want um, them to be able to demonstrate to you? through this assessment. And if you have those goals in mind, then you'll be in a better position to be able to uh, design that assessment effectively. So an essential component to designing assessment is to align the goals of your assessment with your course's learning outcomes. So we all have, um, or should have learning outcomes for your course, your course outcomes or objectives that are, you know, in your syllabus. Um, so we have certain objectives that we want to achieve throughout the course as a whole, and each of our assessments should be touching on at least one of those objectives, the one of those course level objectives. So after you decide what your assessment goals are, you want to figure out how those goals connect to or support your course outcomes or your course objectives. So look at those objectives and see how this assessment fits in um, and how it helps you achieve those course level objectives and measure those. And then you also want to make sure that you communicate those connections clearly to students so that they understand how everything is working together and they see the assessment as meaningful. Because if they don't see the assessment as meaningful, then they're not going to take it as seriously um, or they might be, you know, more flippant about the assessment, like, oh, why do we do this? This isn't going to help me. How am I ever going to use this in the future? Um, you know, those types of things that we hear from students. Um, and if your assessment goals, so your this performance-based assessment goal or goals doesn't align with or doesn't support your course level outcomes or objectives, then you might want to seriously reconsider the assessment goals first because um, those might be easier to revise um, if they don't align with your course level objectives. Um, 
Or, you know, maybe you look at those course level objectives and say, you know, are these really the objectives that I want to have for this course? Is this really what I want students to, to get out of this course and be assessed on in this course? Um, are these really our goals? And sometimes we don't have control over those course level objectives. Sometimes they're mandated by either a licensing body um, or by our department. Um, so sometimes we don't have control over those. So that's the point where we really need to consider our assessment goals and reconsidering those to fit them into those course level objectives. But if you create a, an assessment that you think really gets at what you want uh, students to be able to do based on you know, your course, then maybe that, and you do have control over those course level objectives, then maybe that's where you can do some tweaking as the course level objectives and really reconsider what your goals for the entire course are. So just as kind of like a touch point, um, what are, what are your or who decides what your course level objectives are. Um, so just so that I have an idea of where you all are at with that, like are your course level objectives sort of mandated by your department or have you just kind of inherited them from the last person who taught your course and you're just using their syllabus? Um, or, you know, is there some sort of licensing body or accreditation body that, that controls that? Why don't you share that in the chat just so I can kind of get a, a picture of what, or maybe if you're a TA, you know, you have to follow your cooperating, you know, or you're the instructor of rector, records goals. Okay, so Cheryl, you think that yours came down direct from the department. That might be something you look into too. Maybe, you know, check in with them. You know, are these mandated? Do we have to have to have these objectives. I'm guessing partially with um, yours, Chris, is that you have a master syllabi, yeah, and I'm sure those are based on, you know, nursing licensure as well. So you might have less flexibility with that. And have, oh, hi, Tyler. Tyler. Um, okay, so you're with uh, kinesiology and physical education. Um, so your objectives are dictated by an accrediting body. Okay, so of course you have some leeway as to how you implement those, um, which is great. Um, and you know, you can be, you can kind of, you can work work things, you know, with your assessments so that they do meet those goals. Um, and, you know, they can go above and beyond. So as long as they're touching on one of those course level objectives, if you want to add some nuance to that or have go above and beyond just those, those course level objectives, you can definitely do that too. Um, that's where our academic freedom comes in as well. So, um, yeah, thanks. Um, so once you're clear about what you want the assessment to accomplish, and then how that connects to your course objectives, you can begin to design the assessment itself. So keep in mind that those objectives or goals um, that you created that use Bloom's taxonomy verbs, and those are gonna help you decide how you wanna have students perform some sort of process or create some type of product to demonstrate whether they have met those, those objectives or those goals. And then also keep in mind um, that the goal of in a, a performance-based assessment is to provide students with real-world, practical, and or authentic assessment experiences. And as I mentioned before, that'll look different for each discipline. Um, if you're teaching a general education course or a lower level introductory course, you might consider maybe a broader real world approach to performance based assessment. Um, so, for example, how could they apply that to some situation, you know, in their life as a citizen um, or as a student? Um, you know, in some way, or maybe make it flexible enough where they can, you know, look into what they want their future profession to be and how might they apply that in that profession. I've done that with a, um, a career essay in my, um, 
my uh, writing courses and where I had students write an essay about uh, interviewing a professional in the field that they're considering working in and asking that person questions about what role writing plays in their in that profession and how much writing they have to do, what types of writing they have to do, you know, how much, you know, w whether they have to write every day, you know, all of the different types of writing um, so that they could connect what we were doing in our writing course to some sort of tangible, okay, this, this person, you know, my future profession is going to use writing, whereas they might have thought beforehand, oh, why, why do I need to use writing? Um, you know, I don't need to be in this class because my future profession, I'm not going to have to do any writing. And I've had, you know, students from nursing or students from, you know, who are thinking about going into business think that they're not going to be writing in their future profession. And that, that assignment, you know, had that real world application where they go and they interview somebody in that profession and they find out, yes, this does apply to me. Um, and it is important. So also keep in mind that the goal of performance-based assessment um, is to provide students with authentic assessment experiences. Um, so we want their, their assessment experience to be, um, not to be uh, contrived necessarily. So um, how can we make these assessment experiences relevant to our students and how can we make them see the value in that assessment uh, and see that this isn't just uh, busy work. Um, so again, um, if you're teaching maybe a higher level course for majors, that might look like considering something more specific that applies to professional practice in that discipline. So that's where you might get into more disciplinary specific, authentic, uh, assessment. Um, but you need to decide what makes the most sense for your course and for your students and for your uh, course objectives, your course level objectives, for, your, for the objectives for, for, you know, your learning in that course. Um, and, you know, how that course fits into the, the broader program, right? Um, so if your course fits into a sequence, how are you preparing students for the next course in that sequence too? And how can you create a performance-based assessment that's authentic, um, that gives them that, that authentic uh, assessment experience, that practical real-world experience that will also assist them in, and give them a leg up um, for the next course in that So the next thing that I like to do is to craft a rubric. So once I've designed my assessment, I want students to know what they're going to be graded on. The grading rubric should be aligned with your performance outcomes or goals, um, which are you've already aligned with your course level objectives. And it should represent the key dimensions of the performance-based assessment. And I always share my grading rubrics with my students. I want them to know what they're going to be assessed on. I want them to be successful um, and give them every opportunity for that. So if they have this, this grading rubric, they're, they know exactly what they need to do to get an, ex, you know, get an excellent score, uh, that level of performance, or to get very good or to get good. Um, so they know what's going to be expected of them and how they're going to be graded specifically. Um, so in other words, what are the criteria by which you will assess students' mastery of the performance? What are the essential elements of the performance in which students must demonstrate proficiency or skill? What are the levels of performance that you'll differentiate between to represent students' developmental trajectory toward assessment mastery? So for example, um, and here we've got excellent, very good, good, fair, poor. Um, you might choose different terminology, uh, different descriptors, uh, exemplary, proficient, developing, novice, whatever makes sense uh, for you. Maybe you just use numbers. You get a six, a five, a four, a three, a two. Um, I always start when my rubric with the highest first. Um, I want them to see what it takes to be excellent, for example, or exemplary before they see what it takes to be poor. Um, and their eye is going to to go 
to that column first, and I want them to see that column first. Um, so that's and that's just that's also a best practice, um, a teaching best practice as well. So as you develop those different levels of mastery, make those clear distinctions between each level uh, in your descriptors so that students understand their performance for each criterion and so that your grading is reliable and consistent as well. So um, this example that's on the screen here is just uh, acting style scene performance rubric um, and let me zoom in for myself um, okay so and you can zoom in as well there's a little zoom in um, magnifying glass that you can use to zoom in and out so you can see things a little bit better um, in the collaborate screen um, but for this one, we've got our criteria, our tension and emotion, our memorization, characterization, movement and blocking, diction, projection, and vocal variety, and then there were more uh, criteria here, but I cut them out because we don't really need them. But just to kind of give you an idea of the criteria that we might use for this specific performance rubric. So this is a scene performance rubric for an acting course. Um, and then we would write descriptors. So we've got excellent, very good, good. What does excellent look like? What does very good look like? What does good look like? The nice thing about online assessment um, for this is that you can use an interactive rubric. Um, so it would be through Blackboard. You've got an interactive rubric and you can just check these boxes, uh, click these boxes, and then it will give a grade for you. And then students will be able to see why they got the, the scores that they did for each one of these criteria. And your, the more detailed your descriptors are um, and the more specific that they are and the easier they are to differentiate from one another, the better students will understand you know, their performance. Um, so that's one nice thing about, about having online assessment is that you can have this rubric um, online uh, and use it there. Um, and it's tied directly to the gradebook. Um, so that's just one example of a performance-based assessment rubric. Um, obviously, your rubric is going to be tailored to the assessment that you're um, administering to your students. So uh, it's going to look very different from this if you're not teaching an acting course and it's not a scene performance. So you're going to need to tailor it. You might be able to find you know, some base rubrics to work from online if you do some searching um, and then, you know, edit them and tailor them to your specific assessment. I've never used just an online rubric that I've found as is. You know, it, it might be easier to think of ideas if you have somebody else's ideas and you can kind of pick them apart. So you don't have to start from scratch or see if there's anybody in your department who also might might do this type of performance-based assessment and see if they have a rubric that you can you know use as a jumping off point um, finally develop a learning plan that will help your students prepare for the performance-based assessment you design and this is especially important in an online course we need we need a learning plan for online courses that are going to really help students prepare for this performance because we we don't see them face to face and we can't you know kind of workshop these things in class and and give students that type of the same type of feedback and see those visual cues uh, of student learning so some questions to consider are you know what are the learning experiences that you need to facilitate to prepare students for the assessment um, and that might look different for your online assessment. There might be more steps to that scaffolding um, or more levels to the scaffolding, I should say, that uh, than there might be in a face-to-face -face class, for example. Um, so how could you also break the process or creation up into those more manageable processes? So in other words, um, how do you scaffold student learning leading up to the assessment, you know, maybe in space courses, and what extra scaffolding might students need in your online course, um, or what different types of scaffolding might they need? Uh, another question, what kinds of feedback could you provide to students during the learning process so that they are successful when it comes time to participating in the performance-based assessment? Um, so that scaffolding is only as useful, it's useful in students actually doing it, 
uh, and learning just from the process of doing, but also in us providing uh, as the educator, as the instructor, providing feedback during that learning process so that they're successful when it comes time to actually do the assessment. So we want those that the learning process, um, the learning experiences to really prepare them for that assessment. So, and like, like we've mentioned, it might be more difficult in an online environment. And then finally, what technology tools do you need to uh, demonstrate for students or provide tutorials on so that students can participate in the online performance-based assessment? How are they going to do this assessment so that you can see it? Um, and we'll talk about that in, in just a second. So uh, some things to consider that are specifically related to online performance-based assessment are um, how will you conduct the assessment? And I just touched on that uh, in the last slide too. Um, are you gonna use a web conferencing tool like Collaborate or Teams or Zoom? Is the entire class going to be there? And watching each uh, class member's um, per, uh, uh, performance-based assessment. So are, are they watching each other doing this? What are they doing while they're watching? Um, are they going to be doing, you know, peer evaluation or peer grading or, you know, give peer feedback or, you know, are they going to be something? How are you going to ensure that they're still engaged if, you know, they're performing these, these assessments in front of each other? Or will you have students record themselves um, doing the assessment and then submit that recording. How are they going to submit that recording? Um, you know, a few examples. They could do Kaltura Embed. Um, so that works with, um, with an assignment submission where they would then embed their Kaltura video into the assignment submission and submit that. And then you can view the video in line with their submission instead of having to go to an external link. Or they could upload it to YouTube and they could just add the YouTube link, the share link um, there. Or they could upload it to their OneDrive and share the link to their OneDrive file. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that they could record themselves and then submit that recording to you or give you access to that recording. Um, Kaltura Embed also works in discussion boards. So if you want that to be you know, a public performance-based online assessment, but you don't want to do it synchronously, you're teaching an asynchronous course, you can have a discussion board and have them post their videos to the discussion board uh, of them doing the assessment and then give each other some commentary on that. Um, how will you grade the assessment? Are you going to use a rubric, as I've suggested? Are you going to do more written feedback comments? Um, is there a checklist? A checklist might work for you know a, a process-based as, uh, assessment where they have to go through a specific process and do certain steps through that process, and maybe you just check them off as they do them. Um, that's going to depend on the type of assessment. Um, what happens if students have technical difficulties? while they're trying to complete that assessment? What if they have connectivity issues if they're doing a synchronous presentation on Collaborate or Teams or Zoom? Um, is there another option for them? You know, if they're do they are having technical difficulties, can they alternatively record something and submit it? What if they're having technical difficulties uploading their video to Kaltura or to YouTube or, or wherever they're uploading that video? Um, what if they don't have a, a webcam? Uh, what what are what what are the alternatives there? Um, and then, how, if you if there's any required materials or lab equipment or sp specific uh, materials they need to do this performance-based online assessment, how will they get those materials? Um, you know, that's something that maybe you want to think about ahead of the semester, so that you know if they need to purchase any of those materials, they have plenty of time to do so. Or if they need to pick those materials up from campus, then they have have the, the opportunity to do that as well and to make arrangements for that. So those are just some of the um, considerations for online-based assessment um, specifically, um, but there are other considerations as well. Um, so now thinking about just all of those things that I've just gone over, um, let's brainstorm, maybe you brainstorm some ways that you could add performance-based assessment to your courses and to what end? 
why would you add those performance-based assessments to your courses? So think about that and then you can add to the chat or you can raise your hand and, and speak out using your microphone. So thinking specifically about the courses that you teach, and you can pick one course or, you know, because as I've said, different courses are going to have different objectives, and you might implement performance-based assessment in different ways for different courses, even different courses that you're teaching in the same discipline. So what are some, some ways that you could add those performance-based assessments to your courses? So what type of video assignment, like what would be, what would they be doing in the video, a presentation? So what would be the real world application there? What would they be presenting on and how would that connect to, you know, an authentic or real world um, experience, either apl ap applicable to their life or um, to maybe a future profession? Any thoughts or ideas? Yeah, definitely think about it more. I mean, you don't have to have those um, more in-class case studies, presentations also, definitely. Um, are there any like processes that students might need to do in your classes or, or could do in your classes, you know, uh, where they have to go through steps in a process that maybe they would demonstrate? Or, or something that they might create, some something that they might, you know, create from scratch, like that uses that kind of creativity, crafting, anything like that. Yeah, definitely. So to develop a treatment plan for a specific disease, that would be, you know, creating something. That's definitely a performance-based assessment for sure. Thank you, Chris. So maybe for um, maybe for ETRA, um, you know, if you're TAing a class or if you're ever an instructor of record for a class, maybe, um, Cheryl, that might, might mean, um, uh, developing some sort of plan for how to teach a faculty member how to use some type of instructional, a specific type of instructional technology. That might be one idea. Um, so, you know, the student would have to develop, you know, a plan for how to teach the instructor that and develop that, that specific course plan. Um, and then, Tyler, you're in athletic training and kinesiology and physical education. Um, so, you know, if, if you're teaching future physical educators, you know, maybe they develop a lesson plan or a unit plan for um, how they might teach a specific sport five-part case study of an injury throughout the semester? Yeah, uh, an exercise rehabilitation program, definitely. Um, 
yeah, and then demonstrating those exercises to the class. Definitely, that's totally performance-based assessment. Um, so great ideas, and that's awesome feedback. Um, so any questions that anybody still has? I know we're running a little bit short on time here. We've got maybe five minutes left, but I want to answer any questions that you might have on any topics covered by the workshop today, or if you have topic ideas for future workshops, you're really wondering about something, um, post that to the chat and I'll pass it on to my team. Or, you know, if we have something coming up on that, then I can let you know about that too. Um, you can always visit our programs um, on our website, on the, the CIDL website, um, and see what we've got coming up. Our programs for October have been posted already, and November should be posted um, in, within the next few, couple of weeks. So um, I'll definitely take a look at those. I know we've got. No, nobody in this session um, is probably going to care about this, but we have a science, online science labs one coming up next uh, month. Um, there's rubrics, um, just a ton of different topics. Um, so if anybody has any questions or topic ideas, please do post them to the chat. And I'll give you a second to think. Thanks, Cheryl. And if anybody has any questions, I'll, I'll stick around. Um, but thank you for joining us today to talk about strategies for performance-based online assessment. And if you do have any questions about this topic or any other teaching or instructional technology-related topic, feel free to contact CIDL for assistance, or you can contact me directly, too. Um, I will be sending out a post -shop, uh, workshop email. You can feel free to respond to that with any questions as well. Um, and have a great day. And I will stick around to answer any, any questions that are popping up in the chat.